Kurama isn't a bad creature. If you've just gotten into Naruto and all you know is the hateful fox living inside of a 12-year-old, trying to get him to free it so he can seek revenge, then you might easily be forgiven. But people sometimes fail to understand the general concept of Naruto, in which many of the villains aren't actually villains but well-intentioned people who fell to darkness and find themselves pitted against people who have chosen that the ends never justify the means, and that we should always strive to do no harm and save the world. The same is no less true for Kurama, just as it was no less true for Nagato, Obito, and even Madara Uchiha. The shinobi world chews people up and spits them back out, with most people turning toward evil because they want to change the world for the better but don't know how or in some cases because they were hurt and they want to hurt in return. There are a myriad of reasons why villains in Naruto turn out the way that they do, and Kurama's case is very similar. A tailed beast, a majestic creature, a spirit, a force of nature that was created by the Sage of Six Paths to be free, happy, and to help guide the world with the wisdom of the Sage. It was slowly corrupted through constant assaults and those who wished to turn its power against their enemies. In the end, Kurama would find himself imprisoned because of his sheer power, and his brethren hunted by Hashirama Senju in hopes that world peace could be established. Kurama's story is not one for the faint of heart. It's a tale of manipulation and abuse, creating a manipulator and an abuser. But like a scared child whose only reactions are to defend itself, when the hatred is bombarded by pure love, the scars of old begin to mend, and the soul of innocence is slowly restored. Join me today on this journey into Kurama's very soul. Let's explore a scenario in which Kurama was true to his feelings, and in turn found a friend that could help him cope with this situation, and perhaps even alleviate it. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Kurama. Majestic Beast, a son to the Sage of Six Paths. Derived from his power, split into nine, Kurama came into existence before the old man himself. Kurama loved that old man. Playful and kind, the cub wanted nothing more than the attention of the one he loved most. But to his sorrow, he realized the reason with which he had been born. The old man was sick, dying. Perhaps Kurama only existed as a failsafe, but that didn't make him feel any less loved. Ninshu, the concept of using one's own chakra to connect to the hearts of others on a deeper level. Kurama shared that with his creator, something that began to show him wonder. Within each person was a completely different world, a world that looked exactly the same as his own, but vastly different due to one's own perception. This brought him joy in learning to see things through a different light, and it brought him great sorrow. The moon was full, shining beautifully in the sky like the Hoshinotama of the Kitsune of old. A pearl that glistened with power, granting its influence over the fox, the yin energy pouring down from the skies, empowering it. Or so he would have felt if he weren't within a cage. A cage of flesh and bone. His mind was clouded, filled with rage. His deepest, darkest feelings let loose within him. He felt as if he were caught in a vortex of emotions. He was so angry. But why? Why was he angry? He couldn't remember. All he knew was that he wanted to kill and destroy. It was as if he had lost something precious to him. But what? He looked up at the sky, his eye catching the massive fox's star ball, the cratered moon as it looked down on them, the eye of Hamada hovering in the sky, judging the world for its endless wars. He thought back. He once lived in a shrine in the land of fire. He was a happy-go-lucky fox. He was large, but his strut was no less endearing. His dancing and the dragging of his tails carved into the face of the earth craters from lake to lake, forming rivers for the fish to swim in, for the humans to drink from. Oh, how he loved the humans. Each one bore within themselves a seed planted from his deceased father. Each one he loved as if they were the sage himself. The people looked up at him in awe. His upturned lips and gleeful eyes looked down upon them. More than once he had witnessed a child cry in his presence, terrified of the thing they considered a monster. But when this happened, Kurama was not disheartened. He understood that his frame projected power, and from that power people would naturally be afraid, especially the weakest among the humans who did not understand. For those children, he would adopt a smaller form, one far less intimidating, 
a form resembling the cub he once had been, but small enough to fit on their shoulder. He would nuzzle their cheeks and show the affection the sage had once shown him to calm their souls. The children began to cherish him, and the adults slowly lost their fear of this gentle creature. During the time of sowing of seeds, he would show up to various human settlements to help. Large paw prints dotted the landscape as claw marks crossed the tilled soil. New rivers formed nearby to ensure plenty of water for the land. Kurama would even spare some of his own nature chakra to feed the land when humans had yet to understand how overworking the ground could cause lower yields. It should have been a concept all new, but this small village which he favored seemed as ignorant as a newborn, and he loved that about them. They were innocent, just trying to live their best, and he was here to guide and help them. He was revered as a great spirit of this land, a servant of Inari, a Tenko who bridged the sky and granted wishes with his celestial fox powers. The times of harvest came, and each village always brought Kurama excess harvest to show gratitude for his help. Kurama didn't need to eat. He was a being made of chakra, and so long as the land was healthy, he would be too. But their gestures were so kind and pure of heart that he would accept it without a second thought. He would thank them for their provisions and take a smaller form with which to eat it before them. He would eat until he felt he couldn't eat any more. There was a girl. Her name was Kana. At the time, she was but a child, but she was fierce. Her hair was red like flame, and her personality was spicy as one. She was the human he liked the most. She bore within herself a love so deep that nothing seemed to stop her from caring for others, especially Kurama, with which she started out as a servant. Not because he asked or wanted one, but because she wanted to be one. He remembered the first time he met her. It was during harvest season when her father, the village chief of the fledgling settlement Kurama had been protecting, brought to him the yearly offering. As he took his smaller form to eat, she watched with the kindest smile on her face. She watched as he ate so much that he could barely consume another bite. He'd curl up into her lap to sleep and occasionally stretch and lay on his back and let her rub his belly to help him digest the food. She would giggle as his leg would kick the more she scratched him. He loved this human. She was his greatest friend. She would visit him almost every week. And the best part was that she was not afraid of him as other humans were. She would visit him weekly and would hug his massive paws and play on his back. He recalled letting her on and the two of them racing through the forests, the wind in their faces. She would laugh and he too would giggle at her amusement. Years passed and their friendship only grew deeper. Kurama was so pleased that he began to visit her too, transforming, taking human form just to walk inconspicuously among the humans. He hid form well. There were some tells though. Faint lines on his cheeks to represent his whiskers. The pupils of his eyes were slits like a fox. He also had a hard time hiding his tails for some reason. As the seasons passed, his hair would change colors, from a deep red in the summer to a washed out orange in the winter, but he always kept his smile. He would wander into the village in a somewhat regal white kimono, bearing a paw print on the back surrounded by Magatama. The people welcomed him like royalty, and to a point he was. He would spend this time visiting Kana, continuing to play and enjoy her company under her father's smile. Every visit was a feast. There was plenty of food to go around. Such was the blessing of their nature Kami. Kurama's influence brought maximum increase to their work, and his only wishes were that when they had excess, they let it not go bad and give it freely to the villages on hard times. This kind gesture was his way of spreading the love. He was truly living the sage's dreams. But the more he visited, the deeper his relationship with Kana became. And on one particular night, at the next harvest festival, Kana offered herself to Kurama as tribute alongside the food they often brought. He had always been there for her in her village, and in return, she wished to always be there for him. Taking her into his arms, the two were married. It was like a dream. Or perhaps this was where the legends of the Kitsune had come from. The trickster was the playful side of Kurama. The loving companion was who Kurama truly was, and the vengeful deity that was brought upon those who sought war and to destroy the land. And the further from the sage's generation they got, the more Indra's teachings took hold. The Senju and Uchiha clashed often. They threatened life on every side, and their use of chakra in a weaponized way brought war down upon the village Kurama loved so much. The young men and able-bodied elders took up their plows and shears and beat them into spears and swords for the defense of their home. They did not seek war, but they could not let the land be desecrated by those who sought only destruction. On such a night as that, the new harvest came in. A harvest of blood. A slaughter on the field of battle. An entire generation lost. Kana cried for weeks, her father having been killed in battle. Kurama scowled. He growled in rage that innocent life would be spilled to take what he gave so freely to the people. They twisted the land, salting the earth and making it desolate. He took up his blade that he had crafted for him by the greatest blacksmith in the land. 
Wielding this blade in one hand, and the scythe of Kana's father in the other, Kurama made his way off to war to strike vengeance upon those who would dare harm the land or its people. His presence in battle struck fear into the hearts of those who fought. The wars ended as quickly as they began, the great fox of the heavens having descended upon the earth to destroy those who had taken away his father-in-law. Kurama had learned what it meant to be human. He had learned love on a deeper level, and having that love threatened had forced this vengeful Kami to take up arms and smite those who did evil. More than once, he found himself facing off against the Uchiha alongside the Senju. It was during such a time that he faced the Uchiha clan leader, Ryoshi Uchiha. The power of the Sharingan was a power derived from the Sage of Six Paths, and the strength of the Mangekyo Sharingan was so much that Kurama was struck and wounded. Bleeding on the ground, he believed he might die, but when Akihito Senju stepped up, he defended Kurama and pushed Ryoshi back. Kurama would wake up in a tent, his wounds patched up, and Kana by his side, lovingly stroking his cheek. He smiled and looked to Akihito and offered thanks to the man. He would put his hand on Akihito's chest and speak, Soon, very soon, your clan's founder Ashura will be reborn. He'll be born in your line. I've witnessed the future. I plant within you a seed. When next this child is born, he will receive a portion of my power, my nature power. The ability to command the increase of the lands. I foresee him being the pillar to something greater. A cease of war. An era of peace. Bringing with him the protection of both Senju and Uchiha. A peace he will fight, kill, and die to protect. I shall offer him the power that few have wielded on earth to accomplish his goals. Akihito was stunned. To have received the blessing of Inari himself upon his family line, he was left without words. Days passed, weeks, and months, and the war fled from their tiny village. But they were entering a new era, one where war was becoming commonplace. Clans besides the Uchiha and Senju were starting to war. All the while, Kurama would be blessed with the conception of his first child. Sitting there, a gentle smile on his face as he listened closely to the stomach of Kana, sensing a child within whose chakra was strong, bearing his energy, yet being holy and completely physical like Kana. But wars once again flared up, and the tiny village was caught in the middle. Once more, the men prepared for war. Kurama, the de facto leader of this village, would lead them into battle. Upon hearing of a conspiring of multiple villages to destroy his little settlement, Kurama and his own group of elite warriors with whom he imbued his own power, a group he called Tenko, set off to destroy the villages that conspired against them. And he was successful. Returning to his home, feeling as if he could finally take a breath, Kurama let out a sigh. But the closer he drew, the more smoke he saw. His eyes widened, and immediately he was in the trees along with his elite warriors, jumping from limb to limb. Reaching the clearing, he saw it. The flames of the village. He heard the crying of his men as they abandoned formation and ran into the village to save their families. Kurama could not blame them. Soon after, he did the same. Stepping into the center of his burning village, he released a massive wave of wind-style chakra to blow the flames out and rushed towards the home of the chieftain. There, he found servant bodies littered across the ground. Slumping in a corner, he found Kana. Rushing to her aid, he found no pulse, her body littered with stab wounds, a pool of blood gathering about the floor. He rushed over. No. Please, no. I'm begging you, no. He pressed his ear against her chest as his knees, his white kimono, dipped down into the blood, staining red. He attempted to fill her full of his chakra. He did everything in his power to restore Kana to life and, in turn, their unborn child, but nothing worked. He held her in his arms and cried out into the heavens with every negative emotion, wrath and anger. How could this be? What was this concept of love? He had cherished it for so long and now it was the blade he fell upon. Never before had Kurama wanted to die. Right now, he wanted to pull his own blade out and shove it deep into his heart so that he may fall into the afterlife where she was, but he knew that was not possible. He already was a spirit and he could never pass into the afterlife. He was bound to this earth for eternity. How could humans be so evil? How could they do this to him? He had gifted them with protection, with food. He even blessed those who he had fought against, providing food to the very villages that now use the strength derived from that very food to steal his meaning in life away. Those villages had destroyed him. What did he do to deserve this? He stepped out into the greater village, his anger swirling about like a bloody whirlpool. The elite members who had received his blessing of chakra had also lost. They viewed their commander as his expression became that of a vengeful god. They could sense it within him. He was about to level the entire area. So they fled. Those warriors would immortalize their liege, though. When next they formed a village to live and propagate, they remembered him and who he was. A swirling vortex of love, wrath, and finally, at the end, 
blood. And so they named their village Uzushiogakure. Kurama, alone in a village where nothing survived, suddenly took his fox form, a size as large as the mountains that he now peeked over to witness the villages of his enemies who had just destroyed everything he loved. How dare they? How dare they exist any longer in his presence? Their mere existence, the face he had fed them, it all became offense to him. Their lives were offensive, their faces were offensive, their prayers and cries for mercy were offensive. He set about systematically annihilating each and every village in the vicinity. His mercy fell upon none, not the men, nor the women, nor the children. Even the cattle were not spared. If it held within it a breath of life, he revoked their rights to draw it. In one single night, Kurama had gained a new name, the Demon Fox. He began to murder those who had once brought offerings to him, but had grown too greedy. His blessings had made them soft, had made them gluttonous. His kindness had inspired selfishness and self-entitlement within these people. And now, the only good people that he could see in this world had been thrown upon the sword. The mountains were leveled, the villages were craters, the entirety of nature within the land of fire cried out in sorrow. And for two years, no new crops grew in the land. Starvation set in, and for a time the wars dulled. Kurama returned to his temple, forever changed, his heart shredded. He had left it open for all to experience. Love. Scars covered that heart now. Fragile like glass, he coated it in ice to keep it from ever hurting again. As his touch with humans began to fade into nothing, the greed and depravity of man had once again arisen, and many came to seek his power, chief among which were the gold and silver brothers who he had devoured for the hell of it. Let his body break down their frames slowly, painfully. He hoped they screamed in agony for weeks. But this was not so. The only one in agony was Kurama. Not only was he in pain, as the lining in his stomach was devoured by these two, but the very thought of having the same kind of people who had killed Kana living within him made him physically sick. In his shrine, he would just lay there, writhing, part of him hoping that they would kill him, and the other half wishing they would die. He tried everything he could to settle this pain, from the cool burn of mint leaves to drowning them with water. Nothing stopped the determination of these humans. Like larva, they continued to eat through his body until he could no longer handle it. He began to eat grass. A lot of it. Grass, trees, anything green he could eat to induce vomiting. Eventually, as his face was as emerald green as the land about him, he released all he had devoured, including the cursed gold and silver brothers, whose devouring of his flesh had turned them into warped children, the unwanted sons of Kodama. He tried to smash them, to kill them, but their power had been increased by many times as they fled. Once more, Kodama found himself destroying those nearby him for attempting to hurt him. Humans. Such vile creatures, he thought to himself. He looked back on his time spent in the form of one and regretted it. He never again would take the form of a human. They were a mistake. A blemish on the face of a perfect world. He hated that the sage had gifted them chakra. If he hadn't, they surely would not be using it to kill each other and himself. After another wave of destruction, he once more returned to his shrine and brooded for years. But as time passed by like the hands of a clock, war began to dull and form into peace. For a second, Kurama almost sighed in relief. Perhaps finally he could rest. Wrong. A man of dark hair and glistening red eyes appeared before him. He had a commanding presence, as if his mere form demanded that Kurama show fealty to him. He had only felt this presence once before, but he could not pin where. His eyes glowing out of the darkness of his shrine like burning coals. Why have you come, human? Madara would smirk, his scythe in his hand. I have come to put a leash on you, great fox. It's time you and I went for a walk. Kurama growled, his mind running through emotions. He hid it well. Leave, human. Forget your foolish quest for power and return to your village. Madara would plant the gun by Uchiwa, the war fan of his clan, on the ground as he loudly declared it, openly, as if testifying to not only the entirety of the world, but to God himself upon his throne. I have no village any longer. And soon, nobody else will either. Kurama, like a demon, roared as he crawled out of his shrine. Madara did not flinch, only smiling as he raised his fingers to his face. Kurama had gazed into the ruby orbs only once, but that was all it took for Madara to cast him under Genjutsu. Everything beyond that was a fog. He didn't know much beyond what he was experiencing now as he gazed up at the moon. He heard a battle cry. Hashirama! Suddenly, he felt his body lurch forward, as if thinking on its own. He felt a warmth as sapphire armor coated his fur. Before him stood a 1,000-armed wooden idol. 
It broke free from its base and began to walk towards him. The wooden headpiece it wore, like a golem, engaged with Kurama and struck him back. In his own head, Kurama wanted to break free, but every ounce of hatred he had towards Madara was funneled and focused on Hashirama. Kurama witnessed the wood release of the first Okage and felt deep resentment in his heart, Ashura. He had gifted him the power of the land, of increase and fertile land, and now it was being used against him. Suddenly, he felt a break from the Genjutsu. The cage he'd been trapped in was opened and Kurama burst out with a roar. That Genjutsu had tried to increase Kurama's strength and drive by dragging up everything, Kana included. He saw it in his mind's eye. Her death played over and over again. But with each new replay, a new person stood in front of her. Hashirama stood there. Madara stood there. Indra and Ashura. He cried out for them to stop. My father is the sage, he cried to them, bound and unable to move. Are we not brothers, he whimpered through tears. This did not stop them from ending Kana's life. And that rage was now fueling Kurama as he now forgot any allegiance. Indra, Ashura, Uchiha, Senju, none of that mattered anymore. He would kill them both and then eradicate their people. But suddenly, a wooden hand touched his forehead, and a command echoed through his brain. Sit. Kurama's eyes slowly closed as wooden pillars rose behind him and enclosed him. He fell asleep. When next he awoke, he was within another cage. But this time, he was not caged in his own subconscious, but in someone else's. He witnessed a woman sitting far from him, Mito Uzumaki. She sat there, her back turned to him. He tried to reach out his hand to claw her, but she was protected by adamantine chains that sucked more chakra from him. Kurama pulled back and recognized this chakra as the same as of the people who had left his village after Kana's death, those who would call themselves Uzumaki. So even you have betrayed me, Uzumaki, he thought. After having gifted them with his incredible chakra reserves, those chakra reserves were now being used against him. She refused to acknowledge him. As time would pass, he would witness a light in the sky, something hovering above his cage. It grew louder and brighter the longer it was there, and he had understood that he was within the wife of Ashura's next incarnate, Hashirama Senju. The glowing light was an infant growing within its mother, a baby. She was pregnant. In a rage, he attempted to reach up and drain the infant of its life force. This was an insult to him. None knew that he had so long wanted to see the child stolen from him, and now he was witness to this? He would not. If he couldn't see his own child, then why should they be able to? He tried to kill it, not because he needed the chakra, but merely because he found this new life offensive. He wanted it to die. That was the only reason. As he raised his hands higher, a set of chains appeared from the wall and gripped his hands to hold him down. Kurama fought to free himself. In punishment for attempting to seal the baby's chakra, the chains exacted a toll, taking some of Kurama's own chakra and feeding the child with it, causing the light to grow brighter. He was left in that light for so long, blinded by it as it grew, the sound of laughter filling the area. He turned his back to the gate and covered his ears, hoping he could sleep the gestation time away. He nearly escaped the day the child was born. As the child exited from its mother, Kurama planned his own escape, attempting to bust through the seal and back into the world for vengeance. But Hashirama would not allow it. Sealing formulas were poured on top of sealing formulas, before being wrapped up in a nice little bow made of wood release. This induced within Kurama a sensation of sleep which stole from him his consciousness. By the time he awakened, it was over. And so, for years, he rotted in a cell as he waited for the absurdly old Uzumaki woman to die. Eventually, a time would come that she should die, and he was ready to exact his revenge. It was then that he had been ripped from within his cage and sealed into another one. This cage was different. He would not be freed. He had merely been transferred. He cursed the Uzumaki and turned to his cage and slept falling into a depression, realizing he would be imprisoned forever. But something was different about this prison. It possessed a more innocent nature to it. He opened his eyes one day to see a little girl staring at him. He stared back at her. She watched. My host, he thought to himself. She's curious. She wants to know what I am. I'll show her what I am. His claw quickly reached out and slammed against the ground with a loud thud. As his snout pressed through the gate, his eyes glowing with pure hatred, Come closer, girl, his voice boomed through the void. She would flee from him, disappearing into the darkness. He pulled back into the darkness and slumbered. Time passed. He wasn't sure how much. All the days melted together. But eventually, she returned, once more curious. And just like before, he drove her off. But once more, she appeared a third time. She's a fool. Why does she return, he asked himself. This time, he was curious enough to ask her. Why do you return to me ceaselessly, you vexing cur? She would approach the cage because 
I don't like seeing you by yourself. Kurama was confused. What kind of idiocy is this? Speaking in a low growl, he talked to her. I would rather fall to insanity than receive company from you, worm. She sat down and looked up at him. Miss Mito said you're a hateful fox, that all you live for is to kill, and that you weren't good for anything but to be a weapon. Kurama snarled. The irreverence of this human cub, to dare address a god like that. To call them useless after only caging them up. But she was not done speaking. I don't think so, though. His eye turned towards her. I think you're sad. You're angry. I think you're hurt. He growled at her. You think a human could dare scratch me without fancy tricks? She shook her head. No, I mean, I think your heart is hurt. Your spirit. Your eyes hold a sadness to them. You hide it through a scowl, but your eyes cry. Kurama looked into her. What was this girl? She would dare try to empathize with him? It was true that Kurama had in the past possessed the ability to empathetically connect with others. It was what had once made his life so worthwhile. But now, it was a curse. He did not expect her to gain access to it by merely taking it in. He stepped back into the darkness. Show me your scars. Do not pretend to be a friend when you hold me in a cage. She would cock her head. Hi, I'm Kushina. Kushina Uzumaki. It's nice to officially meet you, Ninetales. Kurama sneered at her addressing his name by the number of his tails. He had once been so much more than just a number. He turned and hid in the darkness of his cell and ignored her. She would call out to him and speak to him, but he pretended to sleep. She would eventually leave and he would know peace, but the days after, she continued to return. Every day she returned over and over again to the cage. He slowly began to grow tired of this. Leave me be, you pretentious whelp. I want nothing from you but your cries of agony as I rip through your flesh and snuff your worthless life. She would look into his eyes. You weren't always like that, were you? He looked down on her with rage. She continued to look up at him with curiosity. When I was younger, I grew up in Uzo Shiogakure. My mother and father used to tell me the story of the great fox, the deity Inari, and his astounding love for humans. The moment you entered into me, I couldn't help but remember those stories. Kurama's lip twitched as he uttered a low, guttural growl. Those are but stories. I am the destroyer. I eradicated your villages and people. All that lived and breathed air, I slaughtered them all, from the oldest elder to the youngest infant. Do not think you know me based on an old legend. She smiled. So it was you after all. You're Inari. She beamed like the sun. The story said that you forged the rivers and lakes and that you were the spirit of rice, agriculture, fertility, and metalwork. To this day, the Kogetsune Maru is sought as a symbol of one of your greater works of craftsmanship. Kurama tried to claw her, his hand reaching out as far as possible, hoping that he might be capable of scratching her out of existence, but the girl was smart. She sat just one foot away from where his claw's maximum extended range ended. He barked at her like a rabid dog. She continued, What happened to Inari? You can't say he never existed. If he never had, these stories wouldn't exist. Kurama returned to his cage and ignored her. She sighed. Okay, fine. If you don't want to tell me the story, then I'll just keep coming back over and over again until you do. And so she left once more. Kushina had been told by Mito that this chakra monster was a being made up of only the deepest hatred for mankind, and that the only way to resist him was with love. Mito had said this in a way expecting her to fill her life with love, but Kushina had taken it literally and was trying to physically fight Kurama's hatred with love, love for him, attacking his negative feelings at the heart. Kurama would continue to exist within the caged void until she returned again. Continuing to keep his back to her, he ignored her. She would hum and work creatively, Sometimes she would imagine some scrap paper and sketch things or make origami. Many of her drawings were of Kurama since he was right there and wasn't going anywhere. The perfect reference. One day, as he kept turned away from her, he felt something, like a flea crawling up his tail. He felt it and his eyes opened. He stood and his tail whipped, causing Kushina to go flying. She moaned as she sat up. Kurama raged against the bars, the entire cage shaking as his rage released itself like an agitated caged ape. It is a curse to humankind to touch one of my majestic tails. How dare you touch it? She sat up. It just looked so fluffy. I couldn't help it. He scowled at her. Leave me. Now. She stood and proceeded to leave. She stopped though. I left you something in there. She exited her own subconscious. Kurama looked around and then found some drawings. She had drawn images of Kurama. Some of them were just him. Others were of him and her. But most striking of all, she had drawn an image of him in what appeared to be a human form, one identical to what he had assumed in years gone by. And with each of these images, he bore a gentle expression, nothing he had ever shown Kushina. He looked up. How did she know this? 
The next day, she returned and witnessed him brooding in the corner of his cage. Hi, Ninetales. Kodama would growl. What is this? He pushed the image of his human form towards her. She looked at it. Well, it's you. He bashed the cage with his head. Did you probe my mind? Some accursed jutsu, he demanded to know. She shook her head. Then he continued. Where did you get this image? She was a little startled, but kept her composure. I dreamt it one night. I dream of you sometimes. His eyes stared at her through his eyebrows. You dream of me. She nodded. In my dreams, I sometimes ride upon your back through the forest, and sometimes I see you different. I see you as a tiny fox sprawled out over my lap as I scratch your tummy. Your leg kicks so cutely. Kurama was mortified. Who set you up to this? Is this a mind game you're playing with me? She shook her head. No, I just dream about you at night. I think about all those old stories at night, and then as I sleep, I just imagine what you were like. These dreams then happen all by themselves. He looked down at the paper again, and then back up at Kushina. Kana? She looked at him with curiosity, her head cocked to one side as he spoke. Kurama pushed the picture back. What are you? He asked. She smiled and pointed at herself. My name is Kushina Uzumaki, the last surviving member of the Uzumaki clan. Kurama turned his head to look at her out of the corner of his eye. The last surviving member of the Uzumaki clan. She nodded. I came from Uzoshiogakure, a village known for its ceiling jutsu and high chakra reserves. We were strong, but the other nations feared us. So as I left for Konoha, Uzoshiogakure was assaulted and destroyed by neighboring villages. He sat there and took it all in. He looked down at the little girl in front of him. She then looked up. I told you about me. Now it's only fair that you tell me about yourself, Inari. Kurama laid down within his cage and relented. Fine. He began to recount to her his tale, how he protected the land, provided for the villages, and how he fell in love with a woman named Kana. But he also spoke of the darker side of things, including the wars and the death that he witnessed. I eradicated everything and everyone within the vicinity of me. Nothing and no one survived. He looked down at her. She was crying openly, her hands raised to her eyes as if they were trying to catch the tears. Why do you cry? He asked as she did so. She looked up. Why did they have to kill her? Why couldn't they let you be happy? He was stunned by her question. She continued, Is that why you've become so mean? They killed your love. Seeing this, Kurama felt a strange feeling within himself, something he hadn't experienced in ages. He slowly approached the gate, his nose pushed out to her face. His cold, wet nose touched her forehead. Do not cry for me. You did not kill Kana. She looked up and hugged onto his nose. You shouldn't have had to suffer like that. I wish I could go back in time right now and take her place so you could be happy. Kurama sat there for a moment. You do not need to do that, Kushina. Just so long as you continue to come and talk to me, I will be happy. She looked up, her tears drying, and she smiled. I promise. I'll come talk to you every day. And so she did. She would visit his cage every day. Eventually, her bravery and trust won out, and she passed through the cage. He welcomed her into the space. There, she would hug up against him. He would let her play on his fluffy tails and smile as she giggled, crawling up them and sliding back down. They would continue to converse and speak. They would enjoy their time together, but eventually, one day, she didn't show up. He would gaze out at the void. Kushina, he would call out. Kushina, where are you? Her apparition would appear, tears in her eyes. She spoke. I can't visit today, Kurama. He would come to the gate. Why? She looked up at him. People have taken me. They're bringing me back to their village. They're going to take you away from me. Kurama was shocked. No, I will not allow it, Kushina. She continued to cry. He called out louder. Kushina! He looked down to her. Do you trust me? She nodded. He then continued. Then remove the tag on my gate. Remove the tag and open the seal. Give me freedom. If you do this, I will save you. At any other time, he could have used this sort of moment to escape. And if she had been any other Jinchuriki, he would have abandoned her the moment she ripped the tag off. But not this time. She removed the tag and the gate opened. He stepped out with a look of noble determination, like a knight stepping up to save his princess. In the darkness of the night, as Kushina walked alongside the Kumonin, suddenly with a puff of smoke, Kurama appeared. The massive fox appeared and began to tear apart the Kumonin. He ran off through the forest, Kushina on his back. As the wind blew through her hair, she smiled. As they came closer to the village, Kurama would stop. He would assume human form, the form of a boy no older than Kushina. Still, he had issues with hiding his tails and ears, so he stuffed his ears into a hat and wrapped his tails around his waist. He spoke with his deep voice. Shall I walk you in? She was a little struck by the awkwardness of his voice. Okay, but whatever you do, don't speak. Kurama walked her into the village. Quickly, the two were apprehended. 
Brought to the Hokage for questioning, she spoke on behalf of Kodama. This boy rescued me. The third looked skeptically at him. Who is he? Kushina looked back. His name is... His name is Inari, Inari Uzumaki, another survivor of the Uzumaki clan downfall. Hiruzen looked him over for a moment and thought he witnessed fox slits for eyes, but no, the irises were round like any other human. What do you have to say for yourself? Kurama didn't speak. Kushina stepped in for him. He can't speak, Lord Third. He was there when the village fell and they attempted to slit his throat. All they did was sever the vocal cords. Kurama took that to mean that he needed to sport a new scar. So, as his head was looking down, he formed a scar over his neck that would fool the Hokage. Hiruzen would nod. Kushina would ask if he could remain, reminding him that he had saved her and done the village a favor. Hiruzen would agree to this and state that he could stay in the village due to his great service to it in returning Kushina home. From there, Kurama waited not too far from her. He still left the presence within her to keep her alive, but he wanted to keep close to her anyway, just in case. She explained everything to them and upon being released, she offered to keep an eye on the boy. She led him back to her abode, where she would have an Anbu guard for the foreseeable future. She walked in and sat down. She looked at him. Thank you, Kurama. I'm grateful that you saved me. He spoke. You've become the first friend I've had since I lost everything, Kushina. I do not wish to lose you. I want to continue to protect you. She smiled. I would be grateful if you did. He would smile, and then suddenly, in a puff of smoke, he was gone, having returned inside of her. He was free, able to roam as he wanted, leave if he so pleased. But he didn't want to, as leaving would kill her, and he would not lose Kana again. As this massive, fox-shaped frame laid down, he would look out into the darkness. Kushina would eventually show up again within this realm that he called home. Kushina, what brings you here so late? He asked as she stood there in her pajamas. The Academy, I, I don't have any friends there. A lot of kids tease me because my hair is red. Since you can take a form outside of my body, I was wondering if you'd be willing to go to school with me. It would be suspicious to the Hokage if Inari Uzumaki just up and vanished without explanation. Kurama scoffed and smiled. Okay, I'll go. I'd like to see more about this leaf village that Ashura has created. And this is where I think we should call it quits for the time being. This video was one that brought me quite a bit of excitement when I found the recommendation for it. I could think of so many possibilities and ways to reimagine Kurama and Kushina's characters. I hope you all enjoyed it too. Let me know what your favorite part was, where you think the story should go, and of course any other stories that you might like to see us tell. Did you enjoy our video? Well then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.